Hi there, and welcome to the Praying Christian Women podcast. I'm Jamie Hampton, and I am thrilled to be here today with Allie Worthington. Allie is a well-known author, speaker, business coach, and host of one of my favorite podcasts, The Allie Worthington Show. She's made appearances on Today and Good Morning America, and most recently, she has authored the book, Standing Strong, A Woman's Guide to Overcoming Adversity and Living with Confidence, which I'm really excited to talk about today. Allie, thank you so much for being on the show with us. Well, thank you. I'm honored to be here. What a lovely intro. Thank you. <laughs> well, I love your <laughs> podcast, and I just, I, I really love your, um, just the way you just kind of lay it out there. You don't mince words, and I, we just, I think we all need to hear that. We all need to hear those just down-to-earth messages, and I just, I know you have a lot to say that, that women that are listening now are going to want to hear, so. Mm, thank you. Well, before we get into it, um, mm -hmm. we always ask our um, our guests, what is your favorite prayer closet? Where do you love to feel close to God? And it can be crazy or it can be traditional, wherever you find God. Mine is super crazy, and it's extra crazy right now with this world that we're living in, but I feel the presence of the Lord most in corporate worship. So that could be a group of 10 people worshiping together. It could be a group of thousands of people. I, I started this year at 2020 and New Year's Eve and New Year's Day with one of my sons at the Passion Conference, which was 60,000 people oh all together goodness. worshiping for two days. And to me, corporate worship is just a little glimpse of heaven. When we all get to heaven, if anyone's like, I wonder where Allie is, we should connect. Just find <laughs> me in the choir because I will be there worshiping all day long. It is the greatest sense of joy and peace in my whole life, I find, in, cor in corporate worship. And it is in the middle of corporate worship while everyone else is singing that tends to be where I do some of my best praying and I'm able to hear from him the, the, the clearest. I love that. That We've never gotten that answer. And I just <laughs> love that because I think we forget. We think about prayer and we think of it either being with a group of people in a prayer meeting or totally by yourself, hold up somewhere or, you know, mm -hmm. alone in your car or your shower. But prayer can happen when you're just surrounded by people. And I just, I love that because you really do feel that tangible presence of God in corporate worship. At least I do. I, I definitely can see where you're going there. And in your book, so not, not to jump straight into the book, but mm -hmm. in your book, a couple of times when you felt God clearly speaking to you, you were in the middle of a big conference or just minding my own business worshiping. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I love that. I love that. Um, I kind of, that to me has been one of the most painful parts of, of this year. Uh, you know, every, every Sunday morning we turn on church on YouTube and I look at my husband and go, I miss corporate worship. He Aww. says, we're going to be back sometime. It's just, I, I can't wait when, whenever church opens up and, all of this is over. I will, I will run through like a soul train line and give everybody a high five and be so happy to be back. Well, I've got another question for you before we move yeah. on. And it's, it's a very personal question. Tea or coffee? <laughs> well, I'll tell you, I used to be a coffee drinker. Like I was a Starbucks quad venti girl, probably had six or seven coffees a day. Ooh. And about three years ago, well, yeah, about three years ago, I got sick. I talk about it in Standing Strong. Mm -hmm. And my stomach just decided I was never going to be able to have coffee again. So I'm a decaf tea girl, which is crazy. It's not that crazy. Tea is good. I am a coffee person, but I love tea also. I'm coffee in the morning, tea at night. So mm. not every night, but I really like, I do like tea. Now, are we talking herbal decaf or just like decaffeinated black tea? Oh, no. Decaf green tea and decaf Ooh. ginger tea. Oh, nice. It's just whatever my stomach will let me have. But me being like the, the caffeinated woman, it's just crazy to not be caffeinated anymore. But you get used to it. Well, and it's probably overall healthier. I mean, I've gone through seasons of not being able to tolerate coffee. Mm -hmm. And once you get into it, I mean, you know, it's, it, it probably is a healthier way to go about things. Mm, I've thought about that before, but maybe, but it's definitely no way to live. <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> no, I'm just teasing. I'm just teasing. 
Well, so your book, Standing Strong, mm -hmm. A Woman's Guide to Overcoming Adversity and Living with Confidence, d it comes out September 29th. Is that right? Yeah. Uh huh. Okay. I got a sneak preview and I loved this book, Allie. I, I got into it and it's, and then first I, I read it and I made some notes and then I went back and read my notes and even reading my notes, I just got all fired up. This was, this oh, is yay. a powerful book. So I'm really excited to talk about it. And, um, first of all, what, what led you to the point of needing to write this book? What in your life or in what you saw in the women you were coaching led you to, to see the need for this book? Well, it's actually a really funny story. With every book, I will pray and ask the Lord what the next book is going to be. Sometimes he tells me, sometimes he doesn't. Like for Fierce Faith, which was all about how to overcome fear, he said fear. And I went, okay, great. That's, that's, what, I'm, that's what I'll go toward. But with this one, oh gosh, I mean, I've been, I've been working on this one for ages. I, I was praying about it and I said, but what's the next book going to be about? And he brought back a little piece of a prayer that my mom used to pray over me every night. She used to pray that I would grow to be a great woman of God, strong in my faith and fearless as I face the future. That's what I pray over my sons now, that they'd be great men of God, give them that blessing every night. And a little piece of it came to mind and it was great woman of God. And I thought, well, that's dumb. And <laughs> just kind of put it aside for a, a month because like, you know, as an author, you want to figure out what's on women's hearts. What do they need to hear? What am I talking to them about? You know, what, what is this? That didn't, that didn't fit any of those things. So then I went back to him about three weeks, maybe a month later and said, Lord, could you let me know what the next book is about? And he said in my spirit, not audibly, I already told you. And I thought, darn it. Okay. I don't even know what this means. And I spent about six months before I ever started writing, just praying into it and wrestling through it going, what do you have for women? What do you want women to know? What's coming up for women and having conversations with women all around me. And what was revealed to me in those six months is that God has a lot for women living right now. He has, he wants to partner with them. He wants to bring his plans to life through them, through partnership. But to be able to do it, we have to know who we are in him. We have to get out of our own way and we have to agree to partner with him. And I had this feeling that things were going to get much harder for women. It didn't make sense two years ago. It didn't make sense three years ago. But in spring, when everything started to get hard and I realized, oh, this is, what he, this is what he meant by things are going to get hard and he needs to strengthen women and he wants to partner with them to overcome all the adversity coming at them, then it all made sense. I mean, how, how amazing is he that, that he chooses to work through us years ahead to give us the message that we'll need? And you know, when, when things started getting really hard this year, back in March and April, I found myself picking up my own manuscript and going, okay, Lord, you gave me this a long time ago, but I need to read this again for me. And the book that didn't make sense when I started writing it two years ago, I look back now and go, okay, it makes perfect sense now. So probably the wildest story of how I ever came about writing a book, but this was just me saying, I'm not sure what this is even going to be, but I'm going to lean into it and discover it. That's exciting. And I love it when God does that, when we just, you know, kind of wondering, what are you thinking, Lord? <laughs> calls you to something or you start something and then it just kind of the pieces sort of fall together and that's great. Yeah. This yeah. is definitely a book that we need right now. Mm -hmm. The message that you talk about in the beginning of the book that makes you really angry is mm -hmm. that there's this message that women are receiving that we're the heroines of our own story. How do you see that message as being damaging and what is the truth that needs to replace that message in your mind? Yeah, this was one of those threads that I kind of pulled and followed as I was figuring out what God wanted said in this book, because I kept opening up Instagram or opening up Facebook and getting angry. And I'm not somebody that gets angry very often, but I would get just blazing mad because I would see all of these 
post and this messaging and women believing it, very popular messages, like you said, that we're the hero of our own story and that our success is up to us and we pull ourselves up by the bootstraps and we just work hard and we hustle. And if we do all these things right, we're going to be successful. And I think that personal development is really good. When we develop ourselves, when we make sure that we are emotionally healthy, mentally healthy, physically healthy, spiritually healthy, all those things are good. But when we twist that to self-help and self-empowerment, instead of focusing on God, that's where it gets dangerous because our real source of power and wisdom and strength in this world is Jesus. But if we have a generation of women who are believing this subtle slanted lie that we have to work hard, we have to look good, we're the heroes of our own story. It takes women down a path that will ultimately lead to failure. Failure because they're not partnered with God on things. They're doing things in their own strength. So when things go bad, when failures happen, when they're up against obstacles, the natural thing for them to do is to go, oh, I was believing this whole mindset that was a lie to begin with. But what I'm afraid happens is women come up against obstacles or don't find success in this after believing this stuff. They blame themselves mm -hmm. and they think that they're failures when really it's just the whole line of garbage they were believing set them up for failure. And that's what's so frustrating about it. It's a like, like all powerful lies, it's a subtle shift. It's just enough truth mixed with a little bit of lie to make oh. it really, really dangerous and seductive to people. And I think what we are going to see, what we're beginning to see and what we're going to see in the future is the fruit of that message is destruction, both from the people who listen to it and the people who preach it. And it's important for us as women of God to call it what it is. And that's damaging and a lie because I think the message women need to hear in its place is that God does have great plans for us plans big and small, things people will know about, things people will never know about. He does it with partnering with us. He gives us strength. He gives us wisdom. He gives us power. In our own power, we can't do anything. I mean, God will get us across a hundred finish lines, but he expects us to lace up our shoes and start walking. He will make our path straight. He will make our legs strong. He will tell us what to do every step of the way. It's a partnership. But when all of that's twisted and it's just, you're the hero of your own story, you work hard and hustle and you're going to get everything you want. Don't let anybody tell you no. That is a message that ultimately leads to destruction. And it's, it's a double-edged sword too, because on one side of it, you're, you're puffing yourself up. You're making yourself up to be more than you are mm -hmm. in, on one mm -hmm. hand and, and falsely mustering up this confidence that's you know, built on a house of cards, but on the other end of it, we end up being defeated and completely feeling like a failure. So, you know, instead of acknowledging that we are weak in our flesh and that we have limitations, but that with God, we are strong. You know, it's that paradox of when you are weak, then you are strong, then Christ's power can rest in us. Then we can, you know, move forward in confidence in who God is and not what our circumstances look like or what our limitations are. And I think that's, yeah, that is really important. And I think it's a fine line to walk too, because I think on the other side, there are women who are afraid to, I don't know, um, I guess the way you talk about it in the book is create, that we create these damaging self-limiting narratives mm -hmm. because we're afraid to claim to boast in the Lord. We feel like that's boastful of us. It's kind of the other side of, of the coin, you know? Um, so what, what stories in your own life have you had to reject in order to get past the self limitation that those oh. like brought to you? I know Gosh, so many, it's such a good question. I love how you touched on, you know, the stories we tell ourselves. I think that Sometimes God will put a dream in our hearts or a goal or a vision for something in the future, or just like a, I call it like a God nudge in our heart, something that keeps bubbling up. And because we limit ourselves out of self-doubt or whatever we tell ourselves about ourselves, 
we don't obey. And sometimes obedience is just going, okay, it's kind of like when he gave me the word for this book, obedience was just praying into it and trying to figure out what in the world this even means. Mm -hmm. Or if he gives somebody uh, an idea, maybe to foster a child or to build a garden or to write a book, whatever it is, obedience is going, okay, I'm going to pull on this thread and see where it goes. See if this is a God dream. But sometimes we're disobedient and we call it humility. Ooh. And if we tell ourselves the story that we are actually being humble and we're going, I, that's not for me. I'm just going to stay over here. I'm, I'm going to be humble because I don't want to, I don't want to step out. I don't want to be too big for my britches. I don't want to put myself out there. It's not real humility. It's just disobedience. And there's nothing holy about us holding ourselves back as women when God has called us to be strong. So I love how you touched on that. But for me personally, I think the stories I've had to reject in my, my own life is that I can't count on anybody. When I was little, my dad died in a car accident and my mom and I were left and my mom was in a body cast and she was left grieving and in and, and poverty and growing up, you know, in, in severe poverty, it, it kind of marks you. And to some degree, somewhere along the way, in my mind, I was the only person I could count on. Mm -hmm. And for me, for me to be successful as a, a wife, I need to be able to count on my husband. For me to be successful in life. I need to know that I can trust God and I can count on him and not let my own issues from my past and my childhood hold me back from loving my husband well or having complete faith and trust in God and not trying to, you know, pull back the reins of control into my life all the time. So for me that that story, that um kind of automatic thought pattern that will come up in my life is I'm the only person I can count on. So I have to make sure I'm okay. That's something that I'm always in the process of managing. I'm always speaking truth over it. Um, this morning, I closed my eyes to pray. And, you know, I don't always hear from the Lord. Sometimes when I hear from the Lord, it ends up ending up in a book because it's like, it's that amazing and it's few and far between. It's not like it happens every day. But as I shut my eyes to pray this morning, the Lord is so kind. And he said, you can trust me. I will take care of you. And I'm 44 years old. He's been, he's been telling me this message over and over again since I was a little girl because he's so kind and gracious and knows that I'd need to hear it. Wow. Well, I love, I love in the book when you talk about some of those times hearing from God in these <laughs> big, huge ways, but I also love that just daily dependence. And I think that's that's got to be the key. My, my next question for you was, what would be step one in the process for a woman listening that, that doesn't know where to begin to step out of those self-limiting thoughts or even doesn't even know what they are? Maybe she can't pinpoint what they are, but I think you just hit the nail on the head. Just sit with God and mm -hmm. listen, listen for his direction. Do you have anything other than that that you would give as advice? Yeah, I think it's really important to ask God to open our eyes to our own behavior. You know, self-awareness is really important. Mm -hmm. One of the things for me that helped me unwrap the, the kind of the bindings of this issue that I have was for me learning about the Enneagram. So Enneagram isn't a religious thing. It's just a personality profile, but we want to use it through the lens of the gospel. And for me, the, the self-awareness that I pray for, he brings me different tools to help me kind of hold up a mirror to my own behavior in my own heart so he can start, because until I'm aware of it, he's not going to be able to start working on it with me, you know? So me as an Enneagram 7, I'm known as the fun one. And people think Enneagram 7s are fun all the time. And I was listening to a, a Christian Enneagram coach, Beth McCord, um, from your Enneagram coach, she was explaining all the different Enneagram types. And she said, you know, you're a seven. If the message your heart longs to hear is I will be taken care of. And I heard that and I just wept. Oh. And so little, just using little tools of self-awareness to learn more about ourselves, learn more about our behavior, and then take it to God and say, Lord, I, I think there's, 
I think there's something to this kind of helping me understand how I process the world and how I, how I feel in the world. Help me understand what you want me to know. Bring me the resources, the people or articles or whatever it is to help me know what I need to know so I can partner with you in my own healing process. I mean, sometimes we do have issues we do have thoughts and you hear stories of women going, I prayed about it and voila, I never had an issue again. The Lord just took it away from me. I have not experienced things like that in my life. In my yeah. life, <laughs> thanks. I mean, be great. But in my life, it's more of a go to counseling, talk mm -hmm. to a Christian counselor, read books on this, pray into it, but work on your self-awareness. It's a process and we aren't left alone in that process. God is with us every step of the way. But the key is to invite him into it, ask him to open our eyes to it and ask him to be with us every step of the way. So we don't let those obstacles, we don't let the lies we tell ourselves, we don't let the garbage in, in our broader culture seep in and distract us from the truth of who God is and who we are in him. Yeah. And I, I think that counseling sometimes I think it's becoming more acceptable and mainstream, but mm -hmm. it used to be that if someone was going to counseling or going to therapy, that, that the stigma was that there was something really wrong. Oh and yeah. Now, now it's like, you're not in counseling. I don't feel like that's a responsible <laughs> choice. <laughs> right. Right. Are you really, yeah. Are you doing, are yeah. you doing the right thing here? And, but I do think that having, whether it's a, an official professional counselor or I have some friends that are incredibly insightful that I talk to and they can really just speak truth. You know, like I said, that mm -hmm. I, I love the way that you speak to the questions that are given to you on your podcast. Well, we all have friends that have the gift of discernment or, you know, just, I, I think asking, but I do think there's a time for professional counseling and that that can be very helpful in unraveling some of those stories that we might not even know are there that are limiting yeah. us from living life to the full. Yeah. Well, I want you to share, this was, this was really a great sequence of events here, your blissdom story. And then, oh gosh, can you share the experience <laughs> that, that you had being called away from this ministry? Because I know that there are women out there that whether it's in their churches or their business or their extended life, whatever, that, that they have these things that, that they just feel God has totally called us to, and, and then maybe they feel the nudge being called away. Can you just share that experience? Um, and yeah, just it's, it's pretty crazy. So I, I used to run a really successful, large conference called Blistem. It started in 2008. We had it in Nashville every year. We also had one in Canada. We had it in Dallas. So it was just booming. It was a big enough business that it allowed my husband to have five sons. It allowed him to retire to be the primary parent at home so I could travel and you know build this big company. And in 2012, God told me to quit. And it took me a year to obey because I really didn't want to obey. And ended up giving the company to my co-founders and just obeying God and saying, okay, I you're telling me to do this for some reason my husband agrees with you and <laughs> says, if God told you to do it, we should do it. I was really hoping he wouldn't. And my, my co-founders ended up not continuing with it. And I moved into business coaching, which soon after that, Christine Kane, who is an evangelist, we met socially and she asked me to help her build Propel Women. And I can look back on that and go, oh, it's so obvious that God needed me to obey, to shut that down so he could open these doors in my life. Mm -hmm. So I ran Propel Women. God made it really clear to me, your, t your time at Propel's over. You know, you've built it. You're good. It's, it's time to step out in faith again. So again, took me a little while to obey. Um, I, I eventually obey, but I'm kind of like a middle schooler. I'm going to stomp my feet and complain about it as I'm getting <laughs> ready to. And God was so gracious after I left. A few months after, he put it in my heart to build again. And one of my good friends who lives uh, in a different state, I called her and I said, I, I need you to pray about this because I feel like God's telling me to have Listem next year, but I, I can't mess this up. I can't, I can't step out and not be in God's will. Will you pray about it? Mm 
She said, Oh, I don't need to pray about it. She had written in her journal six months before that the Lord told her that I was going to start it again, that she can't tell me. But when I came to her and humble, here's what, here's the crazy thing. The Lord said, when I humbled myself and came to her, she could confirm it's the Lord's will. And so she had it in her journal dated six months before. So I was like, great, this is amazing. You know, I had to shut the conference down, but then I get to do it again. Lord, you're so great. Like I must've needed to mature. I must've needed to do all these things, but I'm back. I'm doing this thing that I love. So this is 2018, November of 2019, the conference happens. It's so much fun. It's more wonderful than I can even imagine. It's, it's me in my sweet spot of doing what I love to do, bringing all these women together and learning and sharing and had a great time at the end of the conference. I had a, a little gathering in my suite for people and, um, you know, Chipotle and telling stories and everybody left and I got in the bathtub and I was just talking to God and telling him how grateful I was and how happy I was that I got to do this again. And he said in my spirit, clear as day, don't do this again. Oh. And I was like, what? When I read no. that part in your book, I mean, you set the stage perfectly. You're in the bubble bath. You're just kind of relaxing. Like, and, and I, I'm, I'm just like, everything's great. A full circle basking. moment. Yeah. Bas- everything's great. Yeah. How wonderful. Don't, this don't do this again. And I just thought, God, what are you doing here? You know, I'm just- right. Oh, well, I was. I was terrified. So two of my friends were in the suite with me and I I tell them about it. They're like, listen, you're super emotional because God has told you to quit before. You're probably just scared. He's going to tell you that again. You need to just relax. Don't ask anything. Just, just chill for a little bit. But the more I prayed about it as the next two months went on through the end of the year, it was really clear that I couldn't do it again. Mm -hmm. And I remember calling one of my friends who's an author and I said, I've written so much about Blistem in this book and I feel so foolish because I'm going to look like a flake. Like it's so wonderful that I get to tell the story of God letting it come back and him bringing something to life that, that I thought was long dead. And, and now I'm not going to do it again. And she said, well, you're going to have to tell the truth. You didn't get into the business of writing books to not be honest with your audience. Mm. I was like, oh, that's not what I want to hear. Mm. And then COVID happens. And, you know, in March, we weren't imagining that we were still going to not be having events in fall, right? No. I think we were all just thinking, oh, let's get this over with so we can yeah. get back to school and life as usual. weeks at and home. A few, yeah. Yeah. Until <laughs> this blows over. Yeah. And in April, he said, this is why hmm. I told you not to do this again. Because wow. I didn't know a pandemic was happening. I didn't know we weren't going to be meeting again, but God did. And he was gracious and let me, let me bring it back again. But then he was very clear. You did this. Don't do this again. And he saved me from, you know, basically mortgaging my house to rent the convention center in Nashville. And he's so gracious to do it. Um, It was really nice. We were in the final edits of the book and I got to kind of, close the loop on that story and let it all make sense before it went to the printer. But it was really a, a scary bit of obedience for a few months going, I'm, I'm telling the story in a book that doesn't make sense. And I, and I honestly feel a little bit foolish. And, and now I'm just overcome with a, with a huge sense of gratitude. Isn't that amazing? And what I love about that, because I think this is where I have troubles. I love the stories in each of your just recounting when God has spoken to you, I just think, how does she know? How does she just know? Because my, I keep telling people, it's not that I don't trust God. I trust my ability to hear him right. Mm -hmm. And I know he can do all these things. I think sometimes that's a cop out. Sometimes that's fear, but sometimes it really truly is that I just really, I want to get this right. And I just love the, the different ways that you in, incorporate people and scripture and confirmation. So can you talk a little bit about that? Can you share the story of Bianca when, oh, yeah. <laughs> when you, because this is another example of a, when, once you had gone to propel and again, mm-hmm. you felt like this is why this is what I'm supposed to do. And again, God called you to leave. And I think that was the one that happened right in the middle of if, if gathering, right? Yeah. Can you yeah, share so- that story of confirmation? Yeah, it was, um, 
So I'm at if just going to relax because you know me, if there's an event I'm going cause I need corporate worship in my life. <laughs> I always like to go and lean in and first worship songs on. It's great. You know, nothing, thing out of the ordinary second worship song is on. And in the middle of it, God just said one word quit. And you know, I'm often wrong about hearing from God and often I'm wrong because I've told myself something that's really, really great that I want to hear. And so I call it God, but it's really Allie. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, but normally when it's something that sounds a little different than me and it's something I don't necessarily want to hear, I will pretty much assume it's God. And then I'll ask God to send confirmation. So I know it's him. Mm -hmm. And I just sat down in my seat because I knew just with that one word, he illuminated in my mind exactly what he was talking about. And that's my job at Propel, which to me was my dream job. I thought that everything I had done in the business world was leading up to that. And the idea that all of a sudden this was coming to an end. And, you know, my, my first thought is why am I the girl who always has to leave? Why can't mm -hmm. I just do something for a long time? And a few minutes later, Bianca Oltoff was getting ready to speak and she texted me and we had been to if together years and years with both of us being there. But, but for some reason, the one and only time this happened, she texts me and says, I'm getting ready to go on. Can you come down here and pray over me? And I said, sure. So I went down, prayed over her. And then, cause I thought I'm not going to tell her what I heard because she's about to go on and she needs to focus on preaching her message. Mm -hmm. I prayed over her and then I blurted out, God told me to quit Propel. <laughs> <laughs> and she said, Oh, I knew it. And she hugged me. She said, I've been feeling it for a long time, but I didn't want to say anything. I, you know, I wanted to let God tell you. And I said, well, what am I going to do now? And she said, I don't know, but it's going to be good. And we took a selfie in the mirror of her dressing room, you know, to, to, to commemorate such a very important spiritual marker of life uh, with a selfie. Why not? And I just went back up to my seat and just sat there in shock going, okay, that really was you. This is, this is what I need to do. And he's been really gracious with me that when he wants me to do something and he knows I'm not going to want to do it because I'm going to be too afraid or I'm going to be stubborn or, you know, throw anything else in there. He has a few people in my life that he will send to me to give me messages. Uh, one, one of whom's Bianca, the other one's my friend, Carol, who I mentioned before, who had gotten that message from him six months before and written it in her journal. When there's something he wants me to do, he tends to be more subtle and he woos me and he kind of plants a little dream in my heart and will give me a, um, a feeling of discomfort until I move in that direction. It's a little more subtle, but when it's something that he wants me to stop doing, or if I'm on the wrong track or there's something that I need to put an end to, that's when he becomes very loud and very clear. That's, mm -hmm. you know, as an entrepreneur, I always want to start a new and different business because I love that. It's like children. I always want more. <laughs> and, <laughs> you know, occasionally I have an idea for a business and I'll start making plans to move that way. And I will just, I will hear no all the time. When I close my eyes to pray, I'll hear no. And then I'll go, Lord, are you telling me I can't go in this direction? And he'll keep saying no until I go, okay, I'm done. I won't do it. And, you know, I love in scripture where Paul talks about where he's trying to expand the ministry and he's trying to go into Asia and God just won't let him. Yeah. Um, I often feel like Paul trying to be like, well, I just want to go over here. All these people, look, can I just go over here right now? No, no. And I don't <laughs> know how God did it then, but you know, there, there are lots of good things and fun things or things we can do or things that we think we want to do, but God is so kind and gracious and, and closes doors and if we, if we keep opening the wrong ones, I think, I think he gets, he gets more vocal and we'll send those messages just to make sure that we don't go on the wrong track. So do you think that's a cultivated sense of hearing from him? Like, do we need to cultivate that and be intentional about that? Or do you think it's something that God just kind of does? What would you say to someone that says, well, I don't know that I hear from God like that. Has, do you feel like that person yeah. has maybe not been listening and not attuning her ears? Or do you think that different people hear differently? What are your thoughts on that? Well, I have a lot. I never heard from him at all in my whole life until I was 30 years old. And when I was 30, we were done having kids. I had four boys at the time. 
And in church one day, it wasn't audible. It's just in my spirit. I heard clear as anything. First time ever, you will have another son and you will call him Jeremiah. And I thought, that's, that's what? No. It's pretty specific. I'm, <laughs> I'm done having children. And we, like, we were trying, we were working really hard not to have children. And I don't even like that name. And we're after church, my husband said, I think I heard from the Lord today. I think it may be time for me to apply for a new job. And I said, Oh, why? And he said, the Lord said, you've been blessed and you'll be blessed again. And I was like, Oh, that's not a job. That's Jeremiah. And took a pregnancy test that afternoon. What didn't show up pregnant, took another one two days later and it did. Oh my god. And goodness. so of course, you know, having four sons, everyone would be like, is this your girl? And I'd be like, no, this is Jeremiah. And, you and he, he's 12 now. And that was the first time I ever heard from him. So was, was I not listening before? Was I not trying? Probably. Um, but it would go years before I would hear again. And really he would bust in when I really needed a message. Like I definitely wasn't trying to hear him in 2012 when he told me to quit my company. But then as, as he took my life in a certain direction, you know, took me to propel and moved me into a ministry role. That's when I became really focused on learning how to hear and learning how to focus. And to some degree, I think that, you know, God tries to speak. Sometimes people hear audibly, which would be so cool, but I might secretly think I was going crazy if I could hear audibly. I normally just he, hear him kind of inside me. It sounds like me, but it's a little bit different. Some people have visions. Some people just know that they know that they know stuff. It's wisdom. Um, some people have a feeling like my friend Bianca, she's a feeler. Um, she'll just feel a certain way and she'll know that, that that's the Lord leading her. Um, but we want to be careful. It says in scripture that we can quench the Holy Spirit. And when we don't listen or when we think that maybe God is giving us a message, but we don't listen to it, I feel like the Holy Spirit will just back off until we're ready. Mm -hmm. So we really need to kind of lean into them and go, I want to hear from you. Help me understand when you're speaking. Help me stay quiet. Help me recognize when you're speaking. And then also sometimes it can be for me personally, I don't know for everybody, for me personally, if he's told me to do something and I haven't done it, he will be quiet until I do. I, I once took a, a work trip when I was at Propel to Greece and we were in Philippi and I was walking through the ruins and I hadn't heard from him in months and months and months and months. And I'm walking through the ruins and, and I'm trying to talk to him. I'm like, you know, just let, let's, let's have an encounter here. And I got nothing. And finally, I was like, Lord, you haven't spoken to me in so long. Can you throw me a bone? Can, we, can I, I haven't felt you. I don't know what's going on. Like, have mercy. What is it? What's going on? And clear as day, I heard, you can't hear me because you aren't obeying me. And that's biblical, and I, you know, yeah, it's biblical and, that disobedience can. Mm -hmm. And I had to just go back and figure out what was the last thing he told me to do that I hadn't obeyed. He made and you work for it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Go back through and that when, journal. Yeah. And when I would go back and, and figure out what it is and obey and then repent and lean into him and go, Lord, let me hear you again. Let me feel you. Let me, let me have this experience again. That's when he started speaking again. That is what it makes me think of is we got a puppy. He's, 18 weeks old. Oh, and we've so been, cute. We've, he's adorable. He's a black lab. And we have been taking him to obedience class, or I have, and mm -hmm. one select family member comes with me because of COVID. And yep. uh, anyway, he, um, one thing they told us is when you're training a dog, speak the command and don't keep saying it over and over. Just wait until they do what you want. And then you give them the treat, you know, then you, then you respond because if, you know, you get in the habit of saying it again and again and again, they get in the habit of ignoring you. So that's mm -hmm. an interesting parallel, I guess, of God just saying it once and then you just kind of, then it really gets your attention when the silence is lasting longer than you'd like it to. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, what, um, I, I want to talk a little bit about, I thought this was really great. You talked about in decision making you talk about these three different kinds of friends and how I, I really want you to just kind of touch on how do we wisely decide 
who to listen to and when you talk about how, when you're, when you're making decisions, when you have something you think that God has told you and you're trying to look for a way forward, you have cheerleaders, naysayers, and the slow adopter. And can you just talk briefly? I know our time's running out. I could just like have you on here for three hours probably, <laughs> but could you talk briefly about what those types of people are and how we determine who we listen to and surround ourselves with? Yeah, I feel like there's three types of people. There's your cheerleaders, the people who love what you do, are going to support you, are going to cheer you on no matter what it is. There are the naysayers. These are the people that are always going to be critical. They just kind of have a negative view on life and they're going to naysay your dreams. And then there's the slow adopters. And those are the people who, if you're going to share your heart or your dreams with them, they're going to ask a lot of questions. They're going to think it through. You might even be annoyed. Like, why are you asking so many questions? Are you trying to poke holes in my idea? Mm -hmm. But those are the people who, again, are slow to adopt. But once they've thought it through and they've prayed about it and they've thought about it, then you get them on board with their idea, their idea. And those are the voices we really want to kind of turn the volume up the loudest because cheerleaders, we want to put them on a scale of one to 10. We want to put them on a six or a seven because we need the encouragement but sometimes cheerleaders encourage even bad ideas. Mm -hmm. So we love them, but we need to take it with a grain of salt. Naysayers, we want to turn that volume down to a two. We don't want to cut out all critical voices, but we just don't want to give them a prominent seat at the table. But slow adopters, we turn them up to eight or nine because they've thought through things. They've, they're going to pray about it. They're going to give you great advice. And if you have a slow adopter helping you make a decision and they are on board with it, you know, it's going to be a wise decision. So I love thinking about it that way. Cheerleaders are great, but take it with a grain of salt. Naysayers, we're going to turn that volume down, but it's really good to bring slow adopters in around you. If, if anybody, if I don't know how you feel about Enneagram, but one of my best friends is an Enneagram six, she's a loyalist. And we used to work together at Propel and any idea I would have, She'd ask a lot of questions, almost, almost to a point where it would annoy me. Mm -hmm. And then when she would go, okay, what about this? What about this? And she'd bring out three or four things that could potentially go wrong. And I would just, oh, it's fine. We're just going to do this. Well, she was always right. <laughs> and I realized really soon, oh, this woman actually, she's thinking this through. She can see things that could potentially go wrong in advance. I need to start getting her advice on everything that I'm deciding on. So I'm a, I'm a big fan of the slow adopter. Well, I think it's important. I love the way that you find value in all three, but not equal value in all three. And I think that it can be really valuable to kind of think about, not that we want to peg our friends, because I'm sure there's a little bit of each of these in all of our friends, but you know, you know the friends that are just going to cheer you on no matter what. Kind of think about who those friends are, because you know our tendency might be only to go to those friends when we want validation, even if it might not be the best thing. And, yeah. you know, and our, our tendency might be to avoid some of the negative feedback or the slow adopter feedback because we don't have time for that. We want to jump on our dreams now or, you know, that. so I think that's really important to kind of think about. It made me start to think about some of my friends and who are the friends that are in these different camps and how much weight should I put and to make sure that I don't just go to the ones that I know that are going to validate me no matter what, um, that are going to be honest, even when it's hard or even a little harsh and, and that that can be a good thing in small doses. Mm, yeah. So good. Yeah. Well, we're re really running low on time. I, the one last thing I just wanted to ask you is, um, for you personally, what would you say is your biggest prayer struggle and what do you love the most about prayer? Hmm. I think my biggest prayer struggle is I just forget to do it. <laughs> um, I, I tend to talk to God like a friend often, um, but I forget in the busyness of life to make dedicated time that things can't steal that time away from me because work, or the kids, you know, it's always something, right? Or for you, the puppy. Um, <laughs> it's way too easy for me to 
let the, the needs of the day come in and where I don't have a lot of focus time to be able to really spend with him and soak in his word. And I end up just kind of sending up rocket prayers throughout the day, which are, yep. which are still good, but I'm not getting that great time with him. Like I really need. And what I love most about prayer is the fact that he's with us. He hears us. He moves on our behalf that we're not just praying to change ourselves. We're actually praying for him to move on our behalf in the world and that he's able to do that for me and for billions of people all at the exact same time. That, that boggles my mind, well, but I'm so grateful for it. Oh yeah. And you know, we didn't get to talk about it. So our listeners are just going to have to go get your book because <laughs> chapter 10 mm-hmm. is all about prayer. And you talk about this before and after about how you came to view prayer in a way that was more than just, okay, well, God's just going to change me through prayer into my prayers can change the world. God, God wants me to partner in, in changing things. And I, I love that chapter. So we'll save that as a surprise, (laughs) but um, (laughs) where can people find you online, find your book online and find you on social media? Yeah, I'm Allie Worthington everywhere, A-L-L-I, so Allie Worthington podcast and AllieWorthington.com and Allie Worthington on Instagram. Oh, and I just built a quiz. Can I tell you about the quiz? Oh, yeah. Okay, so it's a really fun quiz called What's Your Secret Superpower? And it'll show you, you know, is it loyalty? Is it encouragement? Is it courage? And the Bible verse for your um, superpower type and what you wish people knew about you and what other people wish you knew. So it's super fun. It's on my site, but if you can text to get a link, so you can just send a text and then you'll get a text from me with a link to take it. It takes about two minutes. If you text the word superpower, all one word to five, five, four, 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 you'll get a text from me with a link. So just superpower to five, five, four, 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 and you'll get a text from me. So fun. Oh, that's exciting. Yeah, I'll have to do that. Yeah. Well, it'll be fun to see what your superpower is. I know. I can't wait. <laughs> <laughs> well, Allie, thank you for being here. This has been great. I just, I loved our conversation and we would like to close in prayer for you today. So how can we be praying for you? Yeah, I have a son, my second oldest son has crippling chronic daily migraines So if everyone could pray that, oh, see, I get emotional. I talk about it. I'm sorry. Pray that um, he will find healing, that the Lord would heal him. That would be great. Mm -hmm. All right. Let's pray. God, we just thank you for this time. We just thank you for each person listening and just for the work that you are doing in each of our hearts, just through this conversation and We lift Allie up to you today. We thank you for the vision that you've given her, for the passion, for this message. And we just pray that you would open doors for this book and for her message to get out to many, many women. That you would just um, use this time uh, to just launch this message forward to women that need it. And thank you so much, God, just for this picture of how you see ahead, you pave the way for us. And this book is just like a, it's like a a print testimony to that, that you go before us, you plant seeds in our lives, you give us messages and visions that we don't understand. And then you just make it all make sense. And God, thank you that you are God and we are not. We just pray for an increased ability to trust you and to obey you, even when it doesn't make sense. God, we lift up Allie's son to you. Father, in Jesus' name, we pray for healing. We pray that you would just be close to him now, that you would wash over him with your peace and your love. Lord, you are Jehovah Rapha, the almighty God who heals. We pray that you would bring that healing in whatever way you see fit, but that you would give him relief from the pain of these debilitating migraines, that he would see you in it, God, that he would give glory to you for the relief that he finds. We just pray that while he is in this season and for Allie, while she's just walking beside him in this season of pain, that you would strengthen them, that you would glorify yourself, that no pain would be wasted. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, friend. 
Thanks for joining us on today's episode of the Praying Christian Women podcast. We'd love to hear from you, so please leave us a comment to let us know what questions or topics we can address in future shows. Then hop over to prayingchristianwomen.com slash journal to download your free prayer guide. We're so glad you joined us for today's show, and we wish you God's deepest blessings as you draw closer to Him and change the world one prayer at a time.